Hi there, I'm Matt. In this video, I want to explain my recent experience adding a custom peripheral to an open source soft core called Picasoc, and that contains a RISC-V CPU written by Clifford Wolf. Now, if you don't understand any of that, then don't worry, because I'm going to try and unpack it during the course of the video. I'm trying to make this video quite accessible, but if you've got a bit of C or Verilog experience, it will probably help you get the most out of this. So what does all of that mean? Well, let's start off with the Pico RV32 processor. That's at the heart of it all. The Pico is small, RV is RISC-V, and 32 is the number of bits it is. Damn it, my camera battery is running. So what's RISC-V? Well, RISC-V is an ISA, an instruction set architecture. And that's something that's equivalent to like the Intel i86. If you don't know what that is, it doesn't really matter. But the point of it is that it's the, the tiny instructions that the processor has to execute to run your other bigger programs. So it's at the very smallest, lowest level of the computer. And RISC-V is an open source ISA, which means that you can make your own copies of it, you can make your own versions, you can publish it, and you can use other people's versions. So that's why we use it. Let's have a look at a picture. That will help make it easier to understand. So this part here is the FPGA or the ASIC, whatever it is, it's running the PicoSock. And this part is the PicoSock, the system on chip. And inside the system on chip, we've got the Pico RV32, that's the processor. And then we've got a few peripherals here. We've got a flash controller to talk to some off-board flash. We've got the serial ports, and we've got a bit of RAM inside as well. And then the exciting part for me is being able to add on our own custom peripherals here. So to compare this against an existing processor, let's have a look at the Atmel 328P, which is at the heart of many Arduino boards. So this part here is the central processing unit, the CPU. And just like with the Picker Sock, we've got our RAM and our flash. Now, all this other stuff here is the peripherals. So we've got the I.O. ports, we've got the um, analog comparator, we've got the ADC, we've got some counters and all of that stuff. And if we wanted to add those kinds of things to the Picasoc, we would need to build those peripherals and add them into the fabric. To make all this a bit more concrete, I'm going to download the repository containing the Picasoc, build all of that, and then load it onto this FPGA development board called the Tiny FPGA. So if you're just watching this video and you're not following along, that's fine. But if you want to be following along, then you need to have followed these instructions on how to install the Yosis iStorm toolchain. And if you want to compile the firmware, you're also going to need to compile GCC for RISC-V. And that can take up to about four hours, depending on how fast your computer is. So let's have a look at how you clone the repository and how you build the bitstream for the uh, Picasoc once you've got that stuff working. So we start off by going to the tiny FPGA uh, repository. And you want to take my fork of that because I've got some stuff in there, especially for this video. And then we're going to clone that. And you can see it's downloading there. And then we change into the, um, the directory and the examples directory. And then we've got the Picasoc itself. And in here, we've got a make file, which I'll explain more about how that stuff works in a bit. And then uh, all we need to do is on the command line, type in make, and that starts the whole process, which I've sped up now because it takes quite a long time depending on the computer, maybe two or three minutes. And then right at the end, it tries to load it onto the um, tiny FPGA board, if you've got that plugged in. And uh, we just saw a mistake there, an error, because I needed to uh, press the reset button to enable bootloader mode for it to go in. But now it's loaded. And if we take a close-up of the tiny FPGA board, you can see that LED blinking. OK, so now you've seen how we get all that stuff together how we build that, and then we load it onto the tiny FPGA board. Let's make a change to the firmware that's written in C, and then use GCC to compile the firmware, and then load that back onto the tiny FPGA board. All right, let's take a look at the firmware file. So we've got a loop here and a timer, and we're writing to this reg LEDs, this value in LED timer after shifting it right 16 times to slow the counter down. So what is RegLeds? It is an address in memory defined up here. And the top byte of that is 03. That's the important thing to remember. So in the hardware V file, Verilog file, we've got output, the user LED there. And down here, that is assigned to the zeroth bit of the GPIO register. The GPIO register is defined here. That's a 32-bit register. 
31 down to zero. Now that gets written in this chunk here. So when the top byte of the memory address is 03, remember that from the firmware file, this stuff is going to happen. And we're going to take the uh, first byte, the second byte, the third byte, and the fourth byte, and copy them over to the GPIO. So whenever we write to that uh, memory address that starts with 03, we're going to be writing stuff into GPIO and hence onto the LED. So if we want to make this flash faster, we can shift it right fewer times, recompile that, which will also try and load it onto the tiny FPGA. I forgot to press the button there, so press the button, upload it, and then you can see from the close-up the LED flashing faster. So one of the things that excited me most about looking at this soft core stuff was taking a CPU, I mean, it'd be cool to write one, but it's quite a lot of work. So take one of these new, exciting RISC-V CPUs and then write my own custom peripheral. That seemed a bit more approachable. So what kind of a peripheral could I write? Well, the last few projects I've worked on, I've used some LEDs, these WS2812 intelligent LEDs, and they have a single serial data line in. By reading the data, they can go all different colors. So they're a bit annoying to use because they've got some quite tight timing constraints. So let's have a quick look at how they work. Here's the information on the WS2812 LED. Now, here in the protocol section, you can see to send a zero code, we have to have a short high and a long low. A one is a long high and a short low, and a reset is a long low. And then down here, we've got the timing information. Now, these timings are quite tight. You need to be, if you're running at 16 megahertz, you're maybe counting, you've got a counter and you're counting up to five or 10 or 15 before you need to move on to the next bit in the chain. So you're sending a red, a green, and a blue value. You've got 24 bits to send out. And if any one of those zeros or ones is slightly too long or too short, the whole chain is going to get confused. So if you've got something like, an, if you're doing that and then an interrupt happens, you could end up with some stuttering light effects. And that's what's happened with me recently. And that's what's made me move to the clocked version of these. But with a parallel system on an FPGA, that's no problem for us. We can just run everything at the same time. Let's take another look at this 328p overview diagram to compare it. So we'd have our main loop running on the CPU, and we'd have a um, our counter variable in the SRAM, and the program would be stored in flash. And then our data line would be using one of these I.O. ports. And then the rest of it, we wouldn't be using at all. So that's quite a waste of all of this stuff that's just there that we've got. And that's an interesting thing about using FPGAs to do work, is that you you, you design your system and you only use the resources that you need to fulfill your requirements. Right, let's have a look at the Verilog for the WS2812 driver. So I'm not going to go into this too deeply. We've got a 24-bit input for their RGB data, an 8-bit input for the number of LEDs, a write and a reset flag, and the clock, which actually is 16 megahertz on a tiny FPGA. And down here, you can see at 16 megahertz, the amount we've got to count for an on or off 13 and seven and a reset is 960. So when we get the right flag, we've got to take that RGB data and store it. And then on every clock cycle, we're gonna run a synchronous reset if a reset happens. Otherwise, we're gonna run this very, very simple state machine, which basically just counts through every bit in the string of LEDs and then uh, for each of those bits, counts up to the one or zero period, and then puts them out on the data pin. And here's the make file that I use for most of my FPGA projects. Uh, up here, I change it depending on what the target is. So we're working with the tiny FPGA, so I use the pin definitions for that. And here's the modules we're using. And down here is Yosis for the synthesis, Arachne PNR for the place and route, ice pack for packing the bitstream, and then last of all, we've got tiny prog to program the FPGA, tiny FPGA. This debug here is using iVerilog and GTK Wave for us to run, make debug, and then have a look at what's gonna happen for the first few thousand clock cycles. So here we can see, I've got a write, register the data, and then the data starts coming out, and we can see the end part there, if we zoom in on there. 
we've got the highs and lows that we're expecting sending the data down the chain of LEDs. So from the simulation, we can see that things look like they're working, but it would be good to test this on the hardware before we integrate it into the SOC. So I've got a top module here that does that. We've got an input there, the clock, an output on pin three, and then we've got a counter to slow things down, uh, the RGB data where we're just manipulating the red, and then on every clock, I'm checking to see if all the bits are set. If they are, then I'm going to increment the red, increment the LED, and then register that. And here's the instantiation of the WS2812 LED module with eight LEDs. So just like before, I use the make file to use Yosis to do the synthesis, and then the rest of the tools to create the bit stream that sends it down to the tiny FPGA using the tiny prog programmer. And now you can see a rather lovely red cycling LED effect on the LEDs I've got here. So now we've seen how we can control the WS2812 from Verilog. And we've got to take that module, put it into the system on chip and see how we can combine them together. So if you're following along, then check out my WS2812 branch with the git checkout WS2812. And that will bring the code in and also some code that I copied from Clifford's picker sock that includes a serial control that we can use to later control the WS2812 LED. So here's the new firmware with the serial and the LED driver stuff added. Now I'm changing one of the LEDs for a debugging and then for the, uh, the WS2812 LED, I'm setting the second one or the third one, 012, to be green. And then because the serial stuff has been added, We've got this nice case statement here where we can read a, a key over the serial and then increment the red, green, and blue colors here. So how does this stuff work? Well, over in the animate um, file, just like before, when we were writing to the LED register, we're writing to the WS2812 register. And that's set in animate.h over here at address the high bit byte of the address is 04. So now in the hardware Verilog file, I'm instantiating the WS2812 driver with eight LEDs as before. And I've got my RGB data and the LED number and the flag for capturing that data. And down here, just under where we handled the GPIO earlier, when the high byte is 04, I'm copying the first byte of that 32-bit word to the LED number the second byte to the first byte of the RGB data, and so on. And I'm also setting the LED write flag to be high, which up on line 105 is being set back to zero. So when we write to that address, the information gets registered into the WS2812 driver. Now we could just try building this all again. Remember that we've changed the Verilog now, so we have to rebuild all of the, um, the soft core using Yosis, make the bitstream, and then put that on the FPGA. We're not just changing the firmware this time. So that can take a long time, a couple of minutes. So if there's any small mistake there, then we don't find out until the end. So a really good thing to get into when you're doing this kind of stuff is simulation. So I'm gonna show you how we simulate this now, which is really cool. And then we'll look at the traces, validate everything looks good from the simulation, and then try on the hardware. So we run make sim, and that uses iVerilog to run the simulation test bench. And the amazing thing that still blows me away about this is that because we've got a model of the serial port and a model of the flash, after doing the compilation, we can load that compiled data into the flash. And then as the CPU boots, we can receive the information and see the result of the GPIO register there on the output. So you can see the message from the CPU booting, press enter to continue. And then after a little while, it finishes a simulation and then GT Key Wave starts up uh, automatically for us to have a look at what's going on. So as before, we can zoom in and out. And I've got a few of these things set up for us to look at on the left, but on the left-hand pane, you can see all these different things that we can zoom in and out of and look at every separate part of the CPU, which is absolutely phenomenal. It's really great for learning about how all of this stuff works. So if we want to check see that our stuff is working, we can look to see when this IOMM ready flag goes high. And that first one should be when we write that first LED debug in the firmware.c. So 
the LED, the LED on the tiny FPGA board should go to one at that point, and we can see that it does. So the next thing to check is that a little bit later on, we did that right to the WS2812 at address 04, the high byte was 04, and you can see there the high byte is 04, and the data goes through, it gets registered, and the LED number is correct, 02, so we're trying to set that green to be at 40, which is hex 28. And then if we zoom out, we should see that 012, that chunk of data should have some of the green data set, and you can see that is happening there. So that gives us great confidence that this is going to work when we run it on the chip itself. All right, let's try and flash this onto the tiny FPGA and see if we can control the WS2812s from the PicaSock with our adapted firmware. Fingers crossed. Because we've changed the Verilog, now we need to rebuild the whole SOC. And I've cut that bit out of the video. So what I'm going to show you now is just um, compiling the firmware and flashing that onto that SOC that's already running there and then connecting to it with serial. So we get the splash screen, the PicaSock splash screen, and by pressing one, you can see that I'm incrementing the red, and I can press two and increment the green, and I can press three to increment the blue, and finally I can press four to start this rather lovely RGB animation. And this is a great example of what we can do with this stuff. We can use a custom peripheral to do the hard timing work of the WS2812, but then to do funky animations, it's easier to do that in C. So we leverage the soft call to do that. Right, that's about it. So to sum it all up, what we've done is we've taken this system on chip called PickerSock, and that's open source, and it's using a RISC-V open architecture processor. And we've loaded that onto the tiny FPGA and seen the red light blinking. Then we've made a couple of changes to the C firmware and compiled that using the GCC RISC-V tools and then uploaded that and saw the LED blink twice as fast. I took you through a WS2812 um, LED and why that can be a bit difficult to drive from a microcontroller and showed you my Verilog peripheral and then added that Verilog peripheral to the SOC so that then from C, we can drive that without any of the overhead of the timing requirements. And I think for me, um, looking back on the project, the thing that I found most interesting was being able to see all the way down into the system on chip when it was running in simulation. So when I showed you the GTK debug traces, those are the ones that I ended up with to make the video to show you the traces that were important. But there was nothing that stopped me from deep digging down deeper and seeing how the memory was transferred, seeing like the stack counter, the stack pointer, how everything is happening inside the CPU and having the source code for a CPU and then being able to see it actually all working in the simulation and then compile firmware and run the firmware on that is really amazing. And it's incredible the, the tools that are available for doing this kind of exploration. I'm really thankful that I've got the opportunity to play with that. So thanks to everybody, especially Clifford and the team making the iStorm tools, putting that together so that people like me can learn about this stuff and make videos to helpfully explain it, make it a bit more accessible to other people wanting to tinker about it. So if you've got any feedback, uh, if you want to see more videos, if you think it's too long or too short, or if I've missed anything out in the documentation or the resources, please leave me a comment, um, subscribe to the videos, let me know how you like it. Thanks.